This was interesting to wake up to. Uh, an anonymous NBA executive believes the Denver Nuggets are stuck due to Jamal Murray declining and Michael Porter Jr. being overrated. Denver's second best player is going backwards. Jamal Murray hasn't been the same. There is something about Jamal's health and physical capabilities right now that concern me. Michael Porter is terribly overrated. He's a one-way player and just a scorer. Also, don't think Denver has the assets to get an upgrade. They'll be stuck with the team that they have. Now, personally, I am a firm believer that if you allow anybody to remain anonymous, they just going to get to yapping. Yap, yap, yap. I've never seen an anonymous source, an anonymous GM, executive, scout, say anything of substance. Anything at all. But I did want to make a Denver Nuggets video regardless, so this is my catalyst. Now, the title of that video that I was going to do, and maybe it's still a title, this one, um, was Has the Denver Nuggets Window Closed? Oh, that's a, that's a tough topic, man. It, it really, really is a tough topic, topic because um, realizing that a window is closed is extremely, extremely difficult. A lot of the times we basically come to consensus when it is 100% over, where player X can't stay healthy or and player, player Y is requesting a trade, but like... For the most part, we never really know if a window is closed until they have not won a championship or they haven't won a championship in X amount of years. Now, for what it's worth, for the people that uh, that don't know who I am and how I do things, I'll give you my direct answer right now so you don't have to continue to watch the video. I personally do not believe that the Denver Nuggets window has closed. As long as you have the best player in the world, I feel like you always have a chance. Whether it be Michael Jordan, whether it be LeBron James, whether it be Kobe Bryant and his sense is the best player in the world, go back as far as throughout history. If you you have the best player in the world there is a chance that you can win the the amount of series that are necessary to win another championship and i firmly still do believe that nikola Jokic is the best player in the world hell let's broaden that i i think it's safe to say that if you have one of the three best players in the world that there is a chance to win it all because at the end of the day and we, we haven't seen a team uh disprove this other than i mean maybe you can argue this last year celtics team did disprove this that the teams that end up winning a championship more likely to not have a guy that is top five in the league at the time he wins a championship. Jokic was top five player when he won his. Giannis, top five player. Kawhi Leonard, top five player stint when he was in with Toronto. Of course, Steph Curry. Like, this goes on and on. The only team that's maybe not fitting that is the Boston Celtics of last year because Tatum is not top five, but they have the perfectly constructed roster. So you already got one of the things. You got one of the super major things you need to win a championship, and that is one of the best players in the world. Now, personally, I wasn't a huge fan of their offseason, and I'm not one of those people that think that KCP he was just, I don't know, the string that was keeping everything together. Though he is a great three-point shooter and a great defender, I also watched the Minnesota Timberwolves series, and there are certain matchups where he is just overmatched, whether it be because Anthony Edwards' speed, Anthony Edwards' strength, Anthony Edwards' athleticism, regardless, he just felt overmatched. And I was looking through my notes from um, their series, and one of the things I had in a lot of these games is that I felt like, and I don't have the numbers to prove this, so this is just my opinions about the game in real time, that I thought the Denver Nuggets looked better guarding Anthony Edwards when it was Aaron Gordon guarding him. And I think that has a lot to do with just Aaron Gordon being a bigger body than KCP. Regardless, I, like hurt, uh, lo losing KCP hurts, undoubtedly hurts. But again, I'm not one of those people that think, oh, KCP is gone. They can't win a championship no more. Again, in a vacuum, it's not that big of a deal to me. But when you compare it to their roster from the championship run, where you have Jeff Green. In a vacuum, losing Jeff Green doesn't matter too much. He was 99 years old when he went to Houston. Losing Bruce Brown in a vacuum doesn't hurt too much because he was um, basically a minimum player that came and played his role successfully. But like it won like he was, again, ingrained in this culture and ingrained in this team. But when you add all three of those dudes, uh, Jeff Green, Bruce Brown, and KCP, then we start to have that conversation of this team looking dramatically different and them not doing whatever was necessary to supplement the, that talent, to replace that talent. Now, there are a lot of teams expecting a lot of young players. Um, we just made a video earlier today about Derek Lively and his expectations with the Dallas Mavericks. Like, there are a lot of teams that are expecting young, young players to fit a role and be great in that role. Of course, we have, like, uh, Christian Brown and Julian Strother as the guys for the Denver Nuggets. And I've, ma I've made this point before, and... and uh, I got pushed back on it quite a, a little bit, and I kind of understand what it's coming from, but I made a point a few weeks back when I was referring to the Clippers. And when, when you have a team that is competing every single season, and in order to compete every single season, you have to make adjustments, right? You have to trade two first-round picks to go get an Aaron Gordon, and you have to do this to that. When you do maintain your picks, you got to hit. Now, hitting on those picks don't mean that you have to get Tyrese Maxey. That is hard to do. But hitting on those late 20s means that, oh, we got a legitimate rotational player. Oh, we got a player that we believe can be a starter in the association, right? Because it has to do with bridging the gap. 
because especially with the second apron now, and I think one of the teams that is hurt the most by the second apron is this Denver Nuggets. Um, when you're bridging the gap, you understand that we are so good that we're going to lose players. It is rare that we can, and a team can win a championship and bring the exact team back again. The Celtics just did that, but that is an extreme case that never really happens. So we have to bridge the gap. And this year, I thought that De'Ron Holmes is one of my favorite players in this draft class. It is so unfortunate that we will not get to see him play. Year before that is Julian Strata, who's the homie. I'm hoping that he has a successful season. Um, I'm, I'm going to show you a clip or talk about a clip of uh, Michael Porter Jr. just talking yesterday about Julian Strother. Hunter Tyson, uh, Connor Gillespie, who's already on a different team, so we don't, we don't have to worry about him. Jalen Pickett. These are dudes that they took last year, and basically none of these guys were in the real rotation. There were times where Julian Strother did play, and then he got injured and fell out of love with um, Michael Malone and then didn't really see the floor anymore. But they need some of these dudes to pop. Christian Brown was so very important and, and critical to the championship. That's a, that's a hit, if you ask me, and he's going into his first season as a starter. I would count P. Watt as a hit in, in the time that we've seen of him. As a guy that can jump out of the gym, P. Sw Peyton Swatson, like that's a real guy. So they have a few hits. But then you get like the Busy Bones, the Bo Bo, and so on and so forth. And then I get back to here, the current roster. And I'm looking at it and I, I'm just, there's a lot to be desired here. I still believe that they are a contender. But over the last couple seasons, oh, I've told this story before. Um, but when Jamal, <laughs> the day Jamal Murray went down with his injury, um, that morning I had did an appearance on the podcast. And on that podcast, they asked me, what team do you believe is going to win the NBA Finals? And I said, the Denver Nuggets. And that very night, Jamal Murray went down with his injury. And in my opinion, when they traded for Aaron Gordon, that is when their window opened up. Now, it is extremely unfortunate that that window has been shortened because of Jamal Murray injuries, right? Where he basically didn't play for a, a, a season and a half. Like, I think that their championship window opened in 2020. And now we're sitting in the 2024, 2025 season where I think it's still open. It's just a little bit more closed than it was back then. And Jamal Murray's health, um, like the anonymous GM referred to, is extremely important here, right? Uh, I'm having a hard time trying to decipher what's real and what's not because last year in the playoffs of course he had the two big shots versus the Lakers but his overall like day-to-day -day postseason life was not the Jamal Murray we're used to it is not the Jamal Murray we saw in the NBA finals push from the previous season and then we get to the Olympics and also I, I definitely was watching Team Canada like what what's going on with Jamal? And as we know, it was a lot of his knee. Now, apparently the people over in Denver don't give a damn about that. They're completely confident that Jamal Murray is the player that we norm know him to be and that that knee is not a problem. So much so they gave that man a big time double uh, capital B bag, b -b 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 bag. But even just last night, a preseason game where the Denver Nuggets went against the best player in the world, Ryan Dunn, and this is Mike Malone talking about Jamal Murray. He told me this morning that he had been feeling great, and then all of a sudden last night during the pregame warm-up, it was just starting to feel a little funny, if you will. So again, he had been wrapping up, and they were saying that he was amazing, he was doing good, but yesterday during warm-ups, something happened where he was feeling Funny. Now, he basically ended this by saying, um, he asked Jamal Murray, what do you think your condition is at? And Jamal Murray said he's in a good place. So maybe it's something, maybe it's nothing. But in order for them to keep that window alive, Jamal Murray has to be him. Because they are in an exclusive, exclusive club of being a, a really, really good team, championship level team, while losing the math every single night. I'm sorry, losing the math is a, is a, is a stretch. But they are one of the few low volume three point percentage teams that can say that hey we have a chance in every single series now part of that is because they run people off the line and they don't give up a lot of threes but i do believe that they have to somewhat transition their game at least a little bit and modernize it enough where they are getting their three-point frequency up here's the numbers on three-point frequency in basketball based on last season that lasts the denver nuggets that is insane to me um that lasts behind the pistons the lakers like this is really, really surprising. Now, the best thing about it is that they get a lot of shots at the rim. Obviously, you have Nicole Jokic. And uh, of the teams that are low volume but decent NBA teams, you will see the Lakers, the Orlando Magic. Those teams also get shots at the rim. Same thing with the 76 or So it doesn't matter that much. But again, modernizing that game could go a very long way. It was also something that, that MPJ talked about after their preseason game. I got to cover up these comments, bro, because they is going crazy in the comments for whatever reason. But all you need to know is that in this five-minute interview, um, post-game, interview Michael Porter Jr. says we don't have any volume three-point shooters um me and Julian need to be the team's three-point volume of course he referred to Julian Stroth that we mentioned a little bit earlier and I think this is a fair assessment for Michael Porter Jr. because as good of a three-point shooter he is him getting up six threes a game it's just not 
in my personal opinion, not enough when you're a 40% three-point shooter. And I know we all got the memes. Uh, when he touched the ball, you know what's going up. Well, maybe he needs to touch the ball a little bit more because he needs to be attempted more. So here are the three-point per game shooters in basketball. There's no world where Michael Porter Jr. should be 25th. No way Max Strews, Malik Beasley, Duncan Rock, even Kobe White, there's no way they should be getting more three-point looks than Michael Porter Jr., if you ask me. When it comes to that volume, I believe that Michael Porter Jr. should be towards the top 10 in basketball. He should be attempting eight three-pointers a game. Now, not exclusive three-pointers. That was one thing he mentioned in that press game uh, interview where he don't want to be exclusively a three-point shooter, but he needs to shoot him more. So I'm saying if you take of these 13, you turn these 13 field goal attempts to eight three-pointers, the team gets better. And that's only really asking to take 1.2 more a game, but I think that'll add up in the grand scheme of things. Because though KCP wasn't a high-volume shooter, you do need to replace some of that because Christian Brown, I just don't know what to expect from him just yet. And I think questioning the depth of this team is, is fair. Like, uh, this is not one of the deepest teams in basketball. Not even close to that. Um, they did bring in Brody this season, where I'm excited to see exactly how they use him and can he be uh, positive for this specific team. But it's not the deepest team in basketball. But I always refer back to this guy. Where it's like, I, it doesn't, I guess it doesn't really matter. He also has been teamed up with the perfect teammate for him and Aaron Gordon. Where th that is enough for me to be like, yes, this team could do it um, if this day-to-day uh, -day turns into nothing and if this guy gets his three-point volume up a little bit more. With a team like this, I don't know even what this looks like, but if things are not going well halfway through the season, do you think they feel comfortable enough making a big-time trade with Michael Porter Jr. or so on and so forth? Because I think that when you're cl like closely removed from an NBA championship, it's hard to convince your fan base that a big time swing or a big time trade is something you should be doing. This team got better. That team got better. This team got better. That team got better. Um, and though there are people on the team that think that they got better this offseason, I don't know if I'm one of those people that feel that way. I still think the window is open, but I can't say wholeheartedly that the 2024, 2025 Denver Nuggets will be better than last year's Denver Nuggets. The Jamal Murray stuff is just so interesting to me because basically last year was a career year until he went down with his injury and that injury held him out for a few games. And I think he came back with four games left in the regular season and then played the postseason. Like if he's giving you this level of production, 21 points per game on 48% for the field and 42% from three, then yes, this team, the window is wide open. You, but, but you cannot afford for him to revert back to the version of him that was 31% in the playoffs last year. You let me know in the comment section what you think. Are you on the side of this anonymous executive or do you believe the window is still open?